Great. All right. So again, we are borrowing some slides from NAVCO, UNAVCO, um, and Kate Chervais. And uh, we're talking about the structure for motion workflow. Everybody, please don't kick. All right, so we talked. I swimming in the river. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, hang on, guys. <laughs> So as we talked about last time, the way structure from motion works is we take many images from different angles of the same surface or object. And there is a very um, complicated computer vision algorithm that's able to identify pixels that match up among these images and um, able to do kind of a distance and angle equation to figure out where those images are in space. Um, so we are able to create a point cloud with all these images. There's a lot of different parameters that affect, please stop picking, affect how a structure for motion survey happens. Um, so first we think about the characteristics of the camera itself, the photo. photo. So what's the focal length? Uh, that refers to kind of the um, angle that the uh, a, a view that the camera is able to capture. So the real long focal length, you're kind of a telephoto lens, you're zoomed up, a wide focal length or a short focal length, you're, you have much wider image. Um, obviously the wider the image is, the more area you capture, but then you have a lot more distortion, which can lead to error. So there's kind of a happy medium in there. Um, the sensor size, you know, how many megapixels, usually that's not really a, a consideration these days because we have more megapixels than we know what to do with. Um, the aspect ratio of the photograph, is it a landscape or kind of more of a square? Um, and then how far away are we is the camera from the feature? And that gets into resolution. Um, if we're really high up, you know, maybe we're gonna do a survey a much larger area with less resolution, or are we really close? So obviously, you know, if you're just taking pictures with your phone of an object, you're gonna have very high resolution. But when we go out to survey, a land area, a building, or something like that, there's going to be a trade-off to think about. When we go out to do the survey itself, there's a lot of things to think about. The first one is the angle of the photographs. Um, as you'll experience if you haven't done the 3D model yet with your phone, we have to get every little angle that we can so that um, we have information or you know, point clouds, basically points, X, Y, Z points of that object. Um, so we can't just take a top-down survey of an area, we have to have different angles to get those, um, the undulations or the three-dimensional aspects. So when we do this building, we're gonna do the hotel Mav. Um, we're gonna do a survey from above with different angles. And then we're gonna do one that goes around it as well, at hopefully a lower elevation um, to get the, the sides of the building as well. Fortunately, we have software that drives the drone. Essentially, you basically just create a map um, on, a, on a, a basically like a Google Maps kind of thing, and um, tell the software, the app that drives the drone, how much overlap you want of the photographs. The more overlap, the better. But obviously, there's a trade-off with the flight time. Um, the platform just refers to the drone, or is it a pole? Is it a blimp? Etc. Um, those considerations are important. There's also planes, drone planes that can fly for much longer and get bigger areas. Then how are we going to geo-reference this survey? So we need to think about the targets we're using and what GPS or survey equipment we're using, um, the lighting, the time of day. So we're gonna be going out there in the winter time, kind of in the morning. So there's gonna be pretty intense shadows on part of the building that's gonna be potentially problematic. So we'll just see how that plays out. Just some characteristics of cameras and pictures. Um, the, the focal length refers to basically the length of the lens. Telephoto lenses have longer focal lengths, wide angle lenses have shorter focal lengths which influences the field of view, the angle that you capture. Um, and then the aspect ratio is simply just the length to the width ratio. Um, that could be, you know, there's a lot of different aspect ratios out there. They're typically anywhere from you know, 16 to nine, 
which is the um, you know, kind of wide angle screen that we have on our computers these days, um, down to three to four, which is the typical TV, the old school TV view. Here, there's different approaches to taking photographs for structure of motion. And one term is nadir, and that means you're basically perpendicular. You're looking straight down at the surface of the earth. That is good if you wanna do an aerial photo mosaic. It's not good for structure of motion because you're not getting different angles of the same features to get that texture or three-dimensional properties. Divergence is also problematic, and that simply means you're looking away and not kind of surrounding a feature. So convergence is what we're looking for. And if you think about a building or a ridge, you kind of want to take everything focused around that, that feature so that you can get, for example, this side of the feature and this side of the feature. We want a lot of overlap as much as we can. There's you know, a trade-off between the time it takes to fly and the amount of pictures we take. Um, so that gives you more overlap versus less flight time. Um, you know, drones have limited battery life. I think the battery life for this drone is um, somewhere around 25 minutes for the flights and then it has to land. You can change the batteries out, that sort of thing. Um, so it's important to get that convergent um, there's a convergent photos. It's also important to get photos from different distances and angles. So if there's particular features you want to um, get a better resolution from, you can kind of get closer and take, take more photos like that. We've talked about different platforms and they're trying to take a picture of this ridge over here and they put targets all around it. Um, and we could do it with drones, we could do it with handheld, on a pole, on a balloon. Um, really, depending on the thing you want to document, you could use all of these platforms. So you could do a drone flight, and then you could go supplement with some hand photos. Um, maybe, you know, for example, we're not going to get low elevation images of the um, hotel, so we could walk around and just take photos of the hotel itself, you know, around it from the ground. A lot of things to think about when we're selecting platforms. How large is the area of interest? Um, so the drone that I have is, is kind of a consumer grade drone. And like I said, it's got a flight time of about 20 minutes per battery. Of course, you can buy lots of batteries. Um, and that's going to limit how much of an area you can fly, how fast, how high, etc. Um, so if you need larger areas, there's fixed wing kind of airplane drones that can um, fly much longer and cover large distances. Um, so that's some consideration to think about. Um, there's different cameras and different lenses, different um, sensors that you can use. I was involved in a survey this summer that was attempting to map with infrared camera, heat and water. And so we're looking at where cold water was coming out into a river, where the water is hot, where there is mixing. Um, and that was on a drone as well. So there's an infrared camera. There's a lot of agricultural applications applications that use near infrared sensors that can give you, um, uh, through some analysis, can give you um, some metrics that tell you how well the plants are doing, how, you know, are they healthy, are they sick? Um, you can also estimate evapotranspiration from that imagery. So there's a lot of different sensors that can give you different information. Targets are how you do reference or scale a model based on um, surveying these in. They're showing these kind of barcoded targets that Metashape, the Metashape software can actually generate for you. You can tell it how big you wanna print it and how many you need. And then the software can read these barcodes if the resolution's good enough. Um, we tried that last year and we did the survey in kind of in the evening and we had to do it really quickly. So a lot of these came out blurry and it didn't work super well. We're just gonna use spray paint, make a circle with a dot in the middle. Well, part of this is flying you know, the drone and taking the pictures. The other part is thinking about um, how you're gonna survey your GPS systems. Um, so this is just uh, looking at when you do a GPS survey, do you have core stations around you? In our case, we, we have experience with surveying and Grand Junction. So we know that we're gonna have um, 
we've got the VRS system or VRN system. And so we're gonna be in good shape to use that. So, uh, but you might be doing a survey in a real rural area and you gotta make sure that when you are doing your ground control points that your, the, the, your ability to survey that's gonna work. Here's a, just a rough equipment list. Make sure your platform and all the accoutrements with that, you have all those. Um, so for, for the drone, we'll, we'll look at the kit, what's in there, um, but you've got your controller for the drone, um, a cell phone that actually runs the controller that kind of processes the software. Um, we have the drone itself, um, the camera on the drone, any georeferencing equipment that we need for the GPS survey, as well as um, making our targets on the ground. Um, always extra supplies is good as well. It's always good to make a plan. Um, where are we gonna survey? Are we gonna have everything visible? Um, we're gonna, I've already kind of laid out a flight plan that we'll talk about in, uh, when we go out there in the field. Um, how many photos do we need to take? How long is the survey gonna take? Do we have enough batteries? Um, are there gonna be any obstacles? Um, the airport is nearby and, and our drone knows that, and so it's going to give us some warning messages. We have to make sure that it's actually legal to fly in the area as well. Um, so often it might be good to go out and visit the, the area and kind of think about maybe do your ground control points ahead of identify where any issues might be. Um, another thing about targets is that we want to make sure that they are distributed around the survey area. Um, so they show, you can see the targets are written here in these field notes. Um, they've done about 20 targets across this area. I don't know how big it is, but um, I think we'll do about eight. Um, obviously the more the better. And some tips that they have here is um, not bunching them in a straight line. So making sure they're kind of distributed um, a little bit offset from each other. We'll do them around the um, hotel and the grass. We'll just paint the put the spray paint in the grass and we'll make sure we get about eight around the hotel to cover that area. We've already talked about challenges with GPS. Um, so I'm not gonna recover that here, but um, yeah, we know about you know things that affect GPS error. Um, so there's a lot, lot of things that can, that can do that. Um, the last, last point I'll, I'll mention is Image quality can be really important. You can check that either um, from doing a, a test flight ahead of time. Um, things that affect image quality, I think we're all familiar with taking pictures with our phone now that low light can um, give you poor image quality, um, high contrast. So when we've got the sun and a, a shadow in the same picture, we're not gonna have a lot of information in the shadows. You know, unfortunately, you know, given the fact that we're in the winter time and we're taking the picture of a building, the sun's really low in the sky, so we're gonna have some challenges there. To compensate for that, you can have the drone fly more slowly. And so that when it's taking a picture, it won't be as blurry on the ground. Um, and also just get more overlap as well. So here's a blurry picture that someone took maybe while they're moving the camera and here's a less blurry picture. Um, so the drone flight is, uh, the speed of that flight can be really important for that. Once you take your pictures, um, we've talked about the workflow and MetaShape that will allow you to create your 3D model. All right, any thoughts or questions? We can talk some more when we go out in the field. Um, real quick, and please bring up any questions that you might have. I'm gonna just talk about the software you're gonna use to do the drone flight. Okay, so here's the software. It's called Pix4D. There's a lot of different platforms and softwares and apps. Um, I chose this one because it's free. And <laughs> at least the, the app to fly the drone is free. And the way it works is you can um, you have different options for different kinds of flight paths. So there's a, a basic polygon and you can just, uh, what you do is you just open up a map and it gives you a map based on your, um, you have to be connected to Wi-Fi or a cellular network. 
to get this information. And it uses the phone's GPS to locate where you are, which is that blue dot. And then you can draw a polygon around an area of interest. Now, how accurate is this polygon based on real space? That's as accurate as your phone's GPS is. So it's gonna be plus or minus 10 meters. So that's something to consider. You know, maybe you go a little bit outside of the area just to make sure you capture everything. Um, so you can do a, a square, a polygon. In this case, for 3D models, we're gonna do a double grid. And what that is, is it's gonna do kind of this gridded flight and take pictures at an angle. And then it's gonna go and overlap and do that same flight area, but just kind of rotate at 90 degrees. Um, that way you're gonna get pictures from ideally the same points, but at different angles of the object. Because we're doing a tall building, we'll also do a circular survey. And all it does is it goes up to a specified elevation, specified radius, and then it's gonna take pictures towards the center at an angle all the way around. So we'll do the double grid and the circular. Inside the app, and because it's just a phone, I'm just, I've got a, an Android phone here that's gonna do it. It's gonna be hard to see on the field, so we'll just talk about it here. Um, there's some settings that you can use. So you can change the angle of the camera. 90 degrees is obviously perpendicular to the ground. We don't want that. So we're gonna do about 70 degrees. You can, um, if you end up doing this later in life, play around with that. Um, how much overlap do we want to have? And you can set that here. Um, a lot of overlap is better. Um, so they give you options between 20% and 90% overlap. We'll probably choose somewhere around 70% depending on how long it's gonna take. So the more overlap, the tighter the flight path is, is and the more uh, longer it takes to do that flight path. And then we can set the drone speed, slow to fast. And you can adjust these and see down here, it tells you um, how long the flight's gonna take. So right now under these settings, you can see the flight's gonna take about 15 minutes um, at this elevation. And this is where you would set the elevation for that flight as well. You just drag, drag that. Um, so the higher it is, um, the more, the easier it is to get overlap, but you're gonna have less resolution. So a higher flight, um, you know, you get a bigger area in your image. Um, so you can get a survey a larger area more quickly if the elevation is higher, but of course we have a lower resolution. So those are all the, the settings we can use and we can kind of optimize it based on, we wanna keep it under a 20 minute flight for the battery or something like that. Um, we can try to optimize all this, or you could have a mission where it flies half of it, you bring the drone home, switch the battery out and it goes back out and keeps flying. Once you um, create that flight plan, you save it, and then you basically say go, and it's gonna run through all this checklist to make sure the drone's ready to fly, and then the drone will launch and fly. And um, it's showing here the, the flight in progress, so it's going over a field, and it's taking pictures every so many meters, and um, you know, here's the start, and it's kind of making its way through the gridded flight, and then it's gonna make its way to the end, and then it comes back home. When you're done, you got all those pictures stored on the drone. Um, you can review the images, decide if you need to take any more. And then um, this software platform allows you to upload it directly to the cloud where it'll do the processing for you. Of course, uh, that, that costs money and we have a uh, um, trial, 30-day uh, trial with our Structure from Motion software. So we'll um, just use that to post-process it. There's a lot of different drones out there. We have the DJI Mavic 2 Pro, which is kind of a little bit of a higher end consumer grade. Um, the, there's more professional grade drones out there. The Phantom, this can fly for a lot longer. Um, there's these ones down here, Inspire. These can have different kinds of cameras you can put on them. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of options out there. This is all, of course, just one company. There's different companies out there as well. All right, guys. Um, let's meet down in, at 205. Val, if you want to come over and we'll meet you between the hotel and Confluence Hall, and we'll do this. <laughs>